Hi, everyone. Thank you for staying with us for so long. Uh, last presentation of the day. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good to meet you all. Let's get started. Uh, OK, so this presentation is titled Taming Your Application Environments. We uh, plan for a very complex presentation covering a lot of topics, but we try to simplify it at the end. Yeah, hopefully it's going to be something different to what you've been seeing today. So we are really trying to in inspire you with new ideas. So we'll yep. see how it goes. Let's do it. Yep. All right. So my name is Marcos. I'm a software engineer at Dagger. I'm Mauricio. I'm a software engineer at Diagrid. So what are we going to be talking about? First and foremost, um, what is an environment? Mm -hmm. uh, what makes or what can make your application cross environments? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we're going to be showing you a demo, a hands-on demo, on how you can actually make a, a unified experience that works across all the environments. So before we start, uh, I did this at Application Development Con, but if you didn't attend that event, please take a screenshot here. Uh, this is a survey that we created as part of the Application Development Working Group, and we want to get information, we want to get your opinions about uh, the tools that developers are using nowadays. So if you are an application developer, please fill the survey if you can. This will help a lot. And if you are like not a software engine, like not a developer, please share it with your developers inside your company. So. What is an environment? Uh, the question is really difficult, right? Because it really depends on many things, and especially in your context and in your organization. So probably my, an environment in my company is very different to an environment in your company, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we usually tend to like standardize this across like testing, staging, production, and all that. But there's way more many things that can actually make an environment. In this uh, sample image that you can see here, we have like a typical architecture. We have maybe like two applications that communicate with each other. And then there's some infrastructure and then some tooling that actually provisions these applications that actually make part of this environment. But if we try to think a little bit more about it, is also my local environment, uh, uh, my local machine an environment? Is maybe my Docker Compose an environment as well? What about the kind cluster, VMs, uh, CI pipeline? And ultimately, maybe some of you never thought about this, but what about a PR, right? So when I open a PR against a repo, that PR may contain some manifests and software delivery artifacts that may be an environment or not. So we're going to expand on this a bit later during the demo. And the question is, to this, uh, the answer to this question, sorry, is like, uh, well, yes, maybe, I don't know. Uh, the reality, like any other answer to any uh, computer science question, is like, it depends, or yes, maybe, right? And it depends on. Uh, basically your organization, right? Uh, similarly to the Conway's law of software engineering, we could say the same thing with environments, right? It really depends what you, you and your team and maybe your, your requirements are uh, actually uh, implied, that, that, that means. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on the tools and the way that you are working. So in order to make this, want to say anything? No, no, go for it. In order to, say, to, um, to be like less abstract and to try to like make a concrete example of this. We're going to take a real example, and Mauricio is going to take it from here. Yeah, so basically, like, we try to create an example. Of course, we like to have demos. And in order to create a demo, we need to basically create like, the most simple distributed application that we can. So we have two different applications, two services. They are communicating between each other. And they are using this concept around like, you know, synchronous communication using HTTP or asynchronous communications using RabbitMQ. You can see that if you have these kind of applications, no matter the language, Probably, if you are just developing the services, you will need to have something like Docker Compose to start all the application infrastructure, like in this case, RabbitMQ that it's needed there. It can be Kafka. It can be any other message broker that you want. But also, you need to be aware that inside the application, you will have some dependencies to this infrastructure. So this is kind of like the typical setup for a developer, right? Yep. And we can take a look at the application. So we can see kind of like the application in action. Uh, we just implemented this, so then we can just show all the tools and how they work. So basically, here we have the producer and the consumer. And we have two ways of communicating, kind of like the synchronous way. So if you start clicking there, you will be sending synchronous uh, requests to the other application. And then the asynchronous way of communicating, you are sending in messages via a message broker in this case, right? So you can see like, you know, the, com the communication between the two services. In this case, this is probably running in an environment as we were defining before. Yep. So we will take a look into that. 
So imagine that you're a developer, you're probably running these two services locally, right? Uh, if you are a company, like, you know, if, if you are a company, you are working for a company, you are also hosting that into a more serious environment that it's running against your customers. But it's very possible that you also have some CI pipelines, right, like that will do more things than what developers are doing. In this case, like you're running a pipeline that is going to basically set up a bunch of tools so it can build the services and test that the developer making changes is not breaking anything. You have here different options. You can use Docker Compose for starting the same infrastructure that the developer was starting, but it will be a little bit different, or you can have shared infrastructure where your pipelines can connect and use these, you know, these resources. Uh, and then you go to the more serious environments, the ones that are not that ephemeral, right? Like these are long-lived environments like staging or production, as, as Marcos mentioned before. In this case, there are more resources that you need. Uh, and in this case, is where like, you can install more things on top of your Kubernetes clusters where these applications will be running. But for this, what you need is you need some YAML files, you need some containers that at some point will need to be produced, right? So the question is going back to what is an environment. It's like now what are all these environments sharing in common, right? We looked at the application developer that works in their machine with their tools, then the CI pipelines, and then the more serious environments, right? All of them, they give your application a place to run, right? And that basically has some contracts around it. You need, in this case, for Kubernetes, you need containers. For running your application locally, maybe you just need the runtime of that application. Then you need infrastructure, right? Like you need all the, application, all the components that the application needs to run. In our example, that was RabbitMQ. I'm pretty sure that in your examples, it's a bunch of other components like authentication services and a bunch of other things that the application will need. And then you need someone to configure this infrastructure so everything works. And ultimately, uh, you need to orchestrate the management, creation, and teardown of these environments, environments as well. So mm -hmm. what do all these environments have in common is basically all these uh, items that you see here. Yeah, and no matter the shape or size, we actually need to do two things. Think about how we can make these applications less dependent on the environment, and then think about how we can build experiences to make sure that working across these environments and moving the application across environments is as smooth as possible so we can deliver more software. Yep. So how, imagine, do, how do we do that? Yeah. yeah, how do we do that? I mean, yeah. imagine that it, it is your task as engineers or DevOps or platform engineers to actually uh, come up with this uh, solution, right? Mm -hmm. Someone basically gives you the task of, okay, can you please create an experience where creating the, and managing these environments is as smooth and as good as possible? Well, you would ask it to an LLM, right? Like we all do today. Uh, chat GPT and then exactly yeah, or uh, Anthropic, and in this case, uh, we would say, okay, create a workflow to build, test, and pack an application to either uh, run it locally and in Kubernetes clusters. And as you can probably imagine, the answer to this question is going to be something like this, right? Yeah. So on the right, you can see that you have like uh, your software software factory, which is made out of glue or duct tape, sorry, in this case. It's a duct tape factory. Uh, and what's going to come out of the LLM is going to be a tons of uh, non-reusable boilerplate. So the LLM is going to probably give you a lot of Terraform and a lot of bash scripts and a lot of maybe Pulumi or, I don't know, maybe a, a lot of tools. It's going to be very hard to verify that output because there's no way that you're going to have everything installed to actually make that work, right? And of course, it's going to be very hard as well because it's impossible to know if that actually works even before running it. Uh, because you don't know if there's a typo, maybe the uh, LLM hallucinated maybe some resources that uh, do not exist. There's going to be a mix of uh, outdated and new practices right towards this. Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, uh, this um, basically means that LLMs are not yet good at, at this because what we're trying to do here is create a new experience, right? And LLMs are usually good when you know where you, where you want to go, right? So when you have an idea on what you want, mm -hmm. but if you try to tell it, hey, create me a new experience, which I don't know how that's going to look like, then you're probably en en going to end up with uh, things, like, things like this. So the way to solve that, if you ask any developer, is basically just creating APIs, putting an API between you know, your applications and the infrastructure and making sure that those APIs are consistent across environments. And that's the main reason why I wanted to quickly talk to you about like, the Dapper project that comes next that just graduated this week, so we are extremely excited because this project is pretty much doing that. It's putting a layer between your applications and the infrastructure that is there, providing developers APIs that not only abstract the infrastructure, but also provide cloud-native distributed patterns on top of it. So Dapper gives you kind of that. Like, no matter the language that you're using, you kind of like get some kind of like runtime freedom for your applications because, again, you rely on APIs that will be consistent across environments. So even if you don't use Dapper, like, 
using the idea of exposing APIs that will give you common functionality across environments, I think it's a good idea. With Dapper, in this case, we are using two APIs, the service-to-service -service communication and the publishes and subscribe uh, APIs. These uh, not only give you these functionalities, but also all the cross-cutting concerns behind the APIs, like observability, security, and resiliency. And as you can see down below the, the diagram here, you can swap providers, right? Like in this case, again, the example is using RabbitMQ. We can swap that out because now Dapper is exposing APIs to the application to do the asynchronous communication path. So if we go back to the example diagram that we have for our producer and consumer, how Dapper works is that you install Dapper, the control plane, into your cluster, and then Dapper will inject these you know, sidecars very close to your applications, exposing your APIs. So in this case, the applications will be using the Dapper APIs to communicate synchronously and asynchronously, and you can configure all the infrastructure down there. Right? Again, we are just making this a little bit more uh, abstracted from the infrastructure, so you can swap like, like that bottom layer for other components and other implementations if you want to. Can we take a quick, a quick look about like the application view that we can get from Dapper? Yep, of course. So if you go to the, yeah, there. So basically, this is a tool called Conductor that basically will give you this Dapper view of the application. And in this case, again, it's showing you that you have a producer and a consumer and that they are exchanging data both synchronously and asynchronously. One asynchronously going through uh, PubSub in this case, you can see that there is a component there, and in this case, that's been uh, using RabbitMQ. You can move this application to a different environment by just swapping RabbitMQ by something different like Google PubSub or Amazon SQS, uh, and the application doesn't need to change at all. One more thing that I want to show is that because we are using high-level APIs here, you can go to uh, see which are these APIs that we are using, and here you can see two different graphs. The first one is showing all the synchronous communications, like all the things that are happening in there uh, via synchronous communications, and then the pops up, like every time that we publish a message in a, in a synchronous way, you can see all those kind of like application behaviors from uh, a very high level. So it, this is not networking information, but it's more like what behaviors is my application using and consuming here. And Dapper also gives you the advantage that it's not only Kubernetes, right? Like you can have a very, very, very different, very uh, big environment with on-prem workloads and Kubernetes workloads, and then you can connect these applications together by abstracting away how these uh, applications communicate. Cool. That takes us to the next step, right? Like how do we build experiences when we have this complexity on the tools? Yeah, exactly. Thank you for that, Mauricio. So Mauricio just told us how we can abstract infrastructure by actually using Dapper, right? Because it allows us to basically move our applications to whatever we want, mm -hmm. and we can build our API-driven uh, communication across them, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is that with any new tool that we bring to our tool set, then there's a new set of problems that we have to tackle, which is, OK, how do we make this tool work in our environments, right? Uh, in our case, for example, if you, are, if you are bringing Dapper, Dapper has a specific way of working, which is via sidecars, as Marisa was showing in the images. Yep. But then you would have to make that work in your local machine and in CI and in multiple places because you are adding a new component. And then your whole factory, which as I was uh, showing before, becomes a bit slower, right, in order to iterate because you need to like integrate all these tools in your current tooling, mm -hmm. which might be, I don't know, make files, Docker Compose files. Uh, whatever CI YAML format you're currently handling. So let's try to find a solution for that. And I think that just to add on top of that, like here we are just showing Dapper, but what about this if you use Knative for serverless? Or what about if you use Open Feature for feature flagging? Like the more tools that you add into this ecosystem, the more like you need a, like a unified experience that wraps it all for all the environments, for local development, for CI, for you know production. Yep. Stuff. So for that, I'm going to be showcasing Dagger, which is an a API code first programmable CI engine that runs everything everything in containers, which allows you to run the same experience both locally and in any CI provider that you want. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is probably your company, like your little factory, which is like very nice and, and colory. And as you can see, you're probably producing containers today, right? You are shipping like a beast, you know, like make, making your customers happy. Everything's good. But if you peek a little bit inside your factory, it might look something like this in reality, right? Uh, so your software delivery process today is probably made of a, of a bunch of uh, glue and a bunch of like duct tape, as I showed before, mostly because uh, there's several tool chains per teams, right? Like there's no unified process to actually ship, ship software. 
then we live in this world of pain where something works in my dev machine, but then something doesn't work in CI for whatever reason. And then we enter in this loop of like, okay, uh, because I can't run what CI actually does, then I have to actually uh, push my code, wait for CI, I don't know, five, two, 10, 20 minutes to become either green or red. And if it becomes red, then it's the worst day of my, of my life because I need to go back to my computer, make a little typo fix, and then push the code again and do all the thing all over, all over again. And that's part of the experience, right? Like the experience yep. that, that we are talking about here, yeah. And uh, the thing about this is like, if we think about it, we are kind of like suffering the same problems that we suffered with applications 10, 10 years ago when dockers and containers became popular, right? Because we are uh, seeing that companies have a really hard time today actually making that software factory and that delivery pipeline work and especially deliver a unified experience. And why is this, right? And we believe that the reason that this happens is because there's no unified tool right, that actually allows, allows us to encode all this complexity and run them everywhere the same way, which is what Dagger actually does. So what we would like to have, right, is this kind of factory, right? We would like all our companies to become something like this, where you have like a, like a real, real standardized and modularized factory where you can ship fast at, while at the same time uh, making sure that your applications are built with a safetyness and all the best practices that we uh, usually want. So, how does Dagger, Dagger look in a, in a nutshell? As I mentioned before, Dagger is an API-first uh, tool, right? That allows you to encode your pipelines with actual real code, with support like uh, uh, SDKs for TypeScript, Node, and, and Go. Uh, uh, at this moment, sorry, TypeScript, Python, and Go. At this moment, mm -hmm. and if you look at the left, you're going to see that your Makefile factory is something would be similar, uh, similar to the image la that you see there which is basically you generally start your Docker Compose and then you have scripts today that either wait for something to be ready and then you maybe you uh, test or build your applications and then you have some more scripts to actually grab the output of that. And hopefully, if the thing that ran before actually produced the right output, then everything is gonna work. With Dagger, on the other hand, you can actually encode all this logic in an actual programming language where you have proper types, right? So your factory is becoming like, a, like an API type kind of factory Right, you have functions that you can reuse from uh, previous uh, definitions in your in your Dagger modules. Then you can also, at the same time, similarly to your make file factory, you can also like bind services for this particular test function to pass. And then ultimately, you have like proper types, first, first class citizens. So in this case, I'm basically getting the file out of that uh, test result and returning like a, like a concrete type that anyone else in the company can actually make use of because they're actually being able to run this uh, test function. As I said before, take into account that Dagger, since Dagger uh, runs everything in containers, I'm able to run this locally and in CI. And we're gonna see the same, a demo about this in a minute. So for me, I really like this as a, I really like that as a, as a developer because again, I can encode using kind of like building blocks, an API first approach, my setup for different environments. So I think that what Marcos is going to show now is basically how do we run this application like in different places, right? Yeah, exactly. So we're gonna take Mauricio's application, which is an open source repository that we're gonna give you the link at the end of, of the presentation. Mm -hmm. And as you can see here, I have both my uh, consumer app and producer app, mm -hmm. which are Java apps. Mm -hmm. And we are gonna note that we have like a dagger.json at the top of my repo here. And if I print it, you're gonna see that it has a, basically a name, it has an, an SDK that the Dagger application has been, Dagger pipeline has been specified in, mm -hmm. and then a set of dependencies that uh, we're gonna see what that's about uh, in a bit. Once I'm in this application, I can actually say Dagger functions, and this is gonna return what functions, so what's available in my application, right, mm -hmm. to be able to perform. In this case, you can see that I can either call the uh, app function, right, which basically starts both the consumer and the producer. Mm -hmm. I can either handle some things about the producer, I can also handle things about the, uh, sorry, the consumer and then the pr producer as well. And we are gonna see what we are gonna do with the cube uh, function uh, a bit later. Mm -hmm. If we actually go and check this application, let me go here, you are gonna see uh, in, in GitHub that I have like a Dagger folder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's here. And then if I go to the main.go, which is the entry point of my pipelines, because this is code, right, it's very important uh, about the fact that uh, Dagger allows you to encode your pipelines as code, you can immediately reuse all the ecosystem of, of tools around code. And in this case, I'm using basically a simple feature of GitHub Actions. And I can immediately see 
what the pipelines of this application is currently providing me, right? If I can see that I have like these functions that I've showed you in the Dagger functions output before, and then if I see here, I can see that the producer function actually returns a producer type, and if I click on the producer type, I can see that the producer.go is actually enabling me to perform all these capabilities, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, going back to the terminal, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do um, let's give you an example. I'm gonna do dagger call, and then the producer function, pro, uh, producer sorry, uh, and then I have I can do help, and what this is gonna do is basically gonna give me okay these are all the things that you can do on the producer. So let's let's build the producer Java application. I'm gonna say build. And if we look at the um, at the code that this this actually does, which is going to be very similar to the code that I've shown you in the slides before, mm -hmm. as you can see, the, this build function returns a file, which is a first class pipeline uh, construct. And then, if we go, of course, this is like a generic function that other like the consumer also uses because they share a lot of things in common. If I go to the definition, thank you, um, code first pipelines and, and GitHub, you're going to see that in this case. I'm actually calling a Java function from the Dagger ecosystem. I'm selecting the SDK, the Java SDK uh, 17. I'm basically mounting my source code, which is a source code that this, uh, this function receives via arguments. I'm setting a cache mount. This is so when I run this multiple times, I can actually reuse whatever is downloaded by uh, Maven. And then I'm actually packaging the application and returning the target file that gets, gets built inside of this container that Dagger executes. Uh, once I have the output, which is what I, what I ran before, what I ran before was here, Dagger called build, mm -hmm. dig, this gives me a file, right? It's already telling me, okay, you have this file, and I can tell Dagger then what to do with this file in multiple ways. In this case, for example, let's say that I want my file uh, in my local machine, and then I'm gonna give it the same name. So I'm just gonna call this. You're gonna see that this is very fast because I already ran this before and it's, everything is cached. So if I do a less, Sorry, you're going to see that the file is in my local machine, right? And this is already giving me some um, universal execution because anyone that runs this command that I just ran don't even need to have Java installed because Dagger handles basically all the bootstrapping and all the container execution of all this, these definitions, right? So I don't even need to do like Java install or anything at all because uh, Dagger takes care uh, of that for me. I think it's really important to highlight that he basically codify the build process of this application in particular, and that can be reused and shared with other teams that have similar applications. In this case, we have two services. We are reusing the same code to build in the second one as a library, right? Yep. Now let's see uh, like uh, an example a, bit, a little bit more complex where I run both of the applications, right? I have mm -hmm. Mauricio showed that he was using um, the consumer, the producer, then he had like Dapper and then a RabbitMQ service. Mm -hmm. So let's see how that looks in, in Dagger. I'm going to go back to my module, right? So if I go to the main.go here, you're going to see that this module has a function that is called app, right? Can you make it bigger? Bigger? A little bit bigger? Yeah, sorry. There you go. There. We have a, a function that is called app. As you can see, I'm reusing the same function that I showed before, right? I'm basically calling my producer function, mm -hmm. right? I'm getting a producer here. I'm getting a consumer here. Which are gonna are gonna give are gonna give me a container. Mm -hmm. Then I start a Rabbit service, which is uh, the service that both applications are gonna need. Mm -hmm. Then I call the producer service, and then I pass this Rabbit service that I injected. Mm -hmm. I do the same th th uh, same thing with the consumer, sorry. And once I have both of these services, if I look at this service uh, function that you have here, this service function returns like a Dagger service, mm -hmm. which is a first class type to actually say that. This is something that is going to be running and exposing a port, mm -hmm. right? And once I have those two services, I basically tell Dagger, okay, give me a reverse proxy to these services so I can actually connect and basically uh, browse them, right? And browse the application. One last thing that I want to show you before starting this is that if I go to the producer service, mm -hmm. you're going to see that here I basically create like a producer container with mm -hmm. this function that, it, that, that uh, you can see here. And then I basically inject Dapper to this producer service. So what you're seeing here is that I'm basically using the same building blocks for both of the applications because in this case they share a lot of uh, mm -hmm. uh, core components. But then I'm actually building my pipeline little by little and uh, in a type safe way so I can actually run uh, all those things uh, locally in my machine. And for me this is extremely important because again he's bringing some of the functionality that will be only available in a cluster, like running in a Kubernetes cluster when you use a tool like Dapper that you install in a cluster 
closer to the, you know, to the development environment in this case, and it's codified, so anyone else using Dapper can use the same function for bootstrapping Dapper right besides the services. Yeah, if you had to do something like this, yeah. uh, without a tool like this, you would probably have to do like a lot of make file, Docker Compose slash bash yeah. uh, starts and a bunch of other things, mm -hmm. Docker Compose, mm -hmm. and encoding like health checks and waiting for things and injecting services in those uh, tools is not generally like the, the most pleasant uh, path to actually do it, but uh, it works. Um, so let, let me show you how you can run this. So if I do Dagger call uh, app, this is going to give me a service. So with a service, I, I can basically say app. Mm -hmm. And as you can see now, I, this is basically resolving the applications. It's like starting Rabbit here. As you can see here, starting the Rabbit service. Mm -hmm. It's going to be waiting. Uh, in this case, it's uh, yeah, RabbitMQ, as you can see here. Let me show you this. Then it's uh, starting the consumer service. It's, as you can see, it's doing like Maven package. It's basically creating the containers of uh, both the uh, producer and the consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's putting that into a, a um, Java runtime container. And then it's uh, starting the proxy that I uh, showed you before, which is an Nginx that does the reverse proxy. Nginx is going to wait. So basically, I need to start the Java apps. As you can see here, it says like Java start. Mm -hmm. So the Nginx service is going to wait for the Java apps to be happy. And now everything is ready. So I should be able to go to the browser now and do uh, cube app 8080. Mm -hmm. And the application is running. And then I can do cube app 8080, 8081. And the same application that Mauricio was showing you before that was deployed in Kubernetes with mm -hmm. Dapper and a bunch of things, I have it running locally now. And as you can see, everything is connected. Everything is like, you know, sending messages from one place to the other one, mm -hmm. and everything is happy. To wrap it up, because we have a little bit of time, yep. uh, mm -hmm. we're going to do like a final, very complex example, which is we're going to try to run uh, the same setup that Mauricio did in Kubernetes, but locally in my machine. So I'm going to start a Kubernetes cluster. Mm -hmm. I'm going to deploy the Rabbit Helm chart, mm -hmm. the Dapper Helm chart, yep. uh, and then I'm going to basically build these containers and mm -hmm. uh, create the uh, Kubernetes manifest in order for Be this to work. Before that, I, I've heard that you didn't like the UI that much. Should we try like a pull request? What about like a pull request? Is it a pull oh, request an environment? Remember yeah, that? exactly. Yeah. So do you remember that initially in the, uh, at the beginning we told you, hey, what about pull requests? <laughs> Could a pull request be an environment? Yeah. So in this particular case, I opened the pull request mm -hmm. to Mauricio saying, hey, we actually need to merge this, which is like a super important change, as you can see here. Yeah. Well, it's actually a lot of HTML. <laughs> you formatted my HTML. Come but the, uh, you the, important thing, the important thing is somewhere around here. You can show it. Yeah, I'm going to show Let, it. Let's no show it. Uh, OK, it, it's going to be a mystery. But the thing is that imagine that I have to uh, work on this pull request. What I have to do is I have to like uh, check out the code, uh, basically, go, change, to the branch, yeah. go to the branch, recompile the applications, and do all that all over again. And that actually takes a lot of time. The good thing about uh, environments is that this uh, pull request, basically, is actually like a branch somewhere mm -hmm. that has all the necessary artifacts for me to actually build and test the application that I've shown you before, right? Because, mm -hmm. because this is a branch. Mm -hmm. I already have all the Dagger descriptors that I've shown you before, the Dagger code to actually build this. Mm -hmm. It's already there, right? So it would be amazing if, for example, I go to like, uh, like uh, here in like another folder, mm -hmm. right? I go to a folder where nothing is here. It would be amazing if I, even without having the code checked out, I could actually run that environment in my local machine. Mm -hmm. Well, Dagger actually supports this. So instead of running like a local Dagger module, which is what you saw before, I can tell Dagger, hey, Dagger, instead of using my local uh, code to run the, the pipelines, get the pipelines from this uh, URL, mm -hmm. right? As you can see here, this is like basically like a git URL plus the pool free merge uh, branch. And then call the same function that I called before and start everything. What Dagger is going to do is going to treat that pull request as an environment. Mm -hmm. It's going to basically do the same thing that I did before in my local machine. It's going to basically clone the code, start the RamyMQ server, start Dapper and do all the other things, mm -hmm. and basically provide, provide me like, with this unified experience that no matter where the code lives, I can actually like, point Dagger to it and tell Dagger, hey, just make use of that environment that it is defined there in that specific commit. Yeah. Uh, all this is starting. It's going to take a, a little bit. And uh, once this is done, as it should be done now, if I try the cube app 
8080. So for me, I think that this is a great example of how you can create an experience here, right? You are creating some sort of like preview environment in a local machine and removing the kind of like all the boilerplate of developers needing to know where to fork and get the right data and the right. So this is up and if yeah. everything worked, you're going to see rockets here, which you rockets. didn't see before. You, you saw like little like, uh, yeah, mails, yeah. rocket emojis. There you go. Woo. Pull requests. Awesome. Nice. So finally, yeah. we have like a few more minutes. Yeah. And uh, just to wrap up this presentation, as I showed you before, we're going to do like a very complex example, which means instead of only running the applications, we're going to actually run a Kubernetes cluster. So let me show you the code a little bit, a little bit first so you can actually see what I'm talking about. So going back to the main repo, we're going to go to the Dagger module. I told you that we have a cube function, which is defined here, right? Cube. This cube function makes use of uh, what we call a Dagger module, which is like a K3S module. Yeah. Uh, by the way, small parenthesis, Dagger has like a catalog of, of modules that you can find here on Daggerverse.dev. Yeah. And what, the one that I'm particularly using now is this one that it, that it is featured. Uh, um, where you can see this module basically gives you like different functions that you can you can run. Uh, the one that is usually the most common is like this one, the server, which basically starts uh, like a K3S server. And then you, here you have an example of how you can actually uh, use this, both in Go, Python, and TypeScript. So uh, going back to the code, I'm going to say Dagger call cube, and then this returns. Let's see what this returns. Yeah. I need to I need to be in the uh, application repo. So Dagger call. Mm -hmm. Cube. And let's see what this returns. And this is going to take a bit because it needs to like do all the um, deployment and waiting. As, as you can see, I have a service function, so let's call that that would cube service up. And going back to the code while this runs a little bit, uh, you are going to see that cube here. Sorry, wrong window. Uh, cube here. Uh, it's a it's a type. Right, similarly to what I showed you before with the producer and consumer that has a service function, right? And in this case, I'm basically starting K3S, right? I'm starting the service here, K3S. Then I call deploy, which basically what deploy does, we can see actually the definition of this function. What deploy does is basically creates an Alpine container, right? And then uh, installs all the kubectl required tools and the kube config from the K3S server that I just spawned. And then it installs uh, Rabbit MQ, it installs uh, Dapper, and then ultimately it applies the manifests of my applications that live on this repository, particularly on the K3S folder, which are the manifests of my basically uh, um, Rabbit MQ and consumer and producer applications. So going back to the terminal and to wrap it up, as you can see, everything is running now. You're, you're probably thinking, okay, you're running Kubernetes here, but how do I troubleshoot it? Yeah. There's an amazing feature in Dagger where you can actually do Dagger call cube. I need to go to this folder. Dagger call cube. The cube uh, module also, the cube function, sorry, also gave me the capability of, run, of running interactive applications. So in this case, I can say K9 test terminal. Mm -hmm. And what this is going to do, this is going to run K9 test 9S, sorry, inside of Dagger. And then it's going to connect to the cluster that I run uh, in, the, in the upper pane. And as you can see, all the pods are coming up, right? It's like the RabbitMQ is already running. Mm -hmm. Dapper and the producer is like reconciliating because they needed to wait for RabbitMQ to be ready. So if we give it like 10 more seconds, it should, yeah. this should become happy. So now this is running now. Mm -hmm. running. This is running. And hopefully, if the demo gods are with us, I can go to the browser and do local ho um, cube up 8080 one last time ah, almost wait i forgot a p i forgot a p uh, cube good, good, good. up 8080 ah there you go and we have our application running in kubernetes locally. with RabbitMQ, with dapper mm -hmm. everything locally and i can run this the same way anywhere i can run it on ci i can run it on my local machine i can run it on some vm somewhere in the cloud uh, because dagger is currently giving giving us that experience so before we wrap it up, I guess that like something that I like to mention to this community is that I keep chasing Marcos and the Dagger folks to build the functions for CNC, like not CNC, like cloud native projects, right? Like let's say we want to install K-native, I want to be able to install that as a function using an API. 
if we want to install open feature or cross plane, I want that as a function to use there. Like, so we can just consume those instead of thinking about how to install these tools, right? Yep. So I guess that the main takeaways from this presentation is environments will be different no matter the company that you work, and they will come in different shape or forms. You need to find a way to actually manage them, try to manage them in the same way. Uh, the way to do that is usually thinking about which APIs and interfaces and contracts you're going to define to separate your application from your environments, and which APIs are you going to use to build like these experiences. Yep, your software factories, basically. Exactly. Uh, software delivery pipelines are applications, so whenever someone comes to you and tells you, hey, how does your CI CD look like? Yeah. Maybe you have a solution to tell them today it's not a set of YAML scripts, it's actually applications, right? I have like proper types, proper, uh, proper pipelines, and something that runs anywhere. Uh, then adapt the tools to your needs, right? Uh, most of us are currently being hostage of our CI provider because we need to encode our delivery pipeline in their language, which is not ideal because we're basically, if we want to get away, then it's very difficult and painful. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, have fun, and it's okay to brag about your software factory, so hopefully next KubeCon you come and tell us, hey, I built like a super amazing software factory using Dapper and Dagger, and I'm proud to actually show it out. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was one second. There you go. Um, both Dapper and Dagger has bo have booths at the showcase uh, space. So please, if you have any questions or want to, want to chat about more about this, we are heading there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks.